Hi everyone, it's Ronnie here. Welcome to our Mental Wealth Mastery Show. Today I have got an amazing person with me. He's become a friend through a coaching school we are both part of. He's agreed to come and speak to my audience today, which is amazing. So Ben Owen is a professional coach specializing in personal and professional transformation. He's the co-author of the Awaken Men Project, a powerful men's only coaching group that helps high-performing men actualize their potential. He's also the father of two f girls, a fiancé to his partner Poppy, and a business owner. Now, Ben has created the Fast Way to Fitness system in his 20s, which helps hundreds of people transform their life through transforming their body. He brings huge amount of experience and pragmatism to personal transformation, business creation, and long-term results-based coaching and I got an experience of Ben as part of the school because Ben comes out with this amazing like one-liners and everyone is scribbling down what Ben has written so I'm delighted to have Ben here welcome oh, thank Ben you, thank you so much that was lovely and it's actually a, it's a real pleasure to be asked on the podcast as well so I'm looking forward to sharing something that will be helpful for your listeners I'm a psychiatrist and I'm very interested in helping people reconnect to what I call mental wealth and there's a lot of conversation about men's mental health and I know that you are not a mental health professional you are a coach you specifically work with men so tell us a bit about your journey and why why did you choose to work only with men as a coach yeah great question uh, uh, I think the story is actually a, a lot of why I'm now in men's work you know I think from struggle and Sometimes even trauma is where a lot of people create amazing things. And I, I was, um, I was one of these guys. I wasn't traumatized. I wasn't depressed. I was actually a high-performing twenty-year-old with a very successful business. I, you know, I had a lot of success very early on. I came from an elite sport background. Um, I built a very successful business very, very quickly, and my life seemed seemed perfect you know I really did have a really great life and I hadn't known struggle um in my 20s I was you know the business was was growing I met a girl uh, we got married and then one day she turned around and said to me um I'm not happy with you anymore like this was like wow you know out of the blue and and then also at the same time the business um, grew it was growing so fast I, I, I it grew exponentially and I didn't have the 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 business skills to cope with that growth I didn't understand what was going on in terms of the financials and and then all of a sudden the business started to struggle and then I felt I was struggling in my life and this was like heading into my 30s as like probably like an existential crisis probably um but the um what I noticed that I hadn't been given the coping mechanisms to cope at that level so like all the things that seemed um, safe and normal and, and uh, uh, like frequent in my life just disappeared. My partner, my business started to struggle. And, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, hang on a second. Like, how do I deal with all of these struggles as a, as a business owner, as a, as a man? And I started like when I was in my 30s, I was like, I, someone said, oh, go and see a, go and see a counselor. So I went and see a counselor talked didn't find much um benefit in it to be quite honest and that because i was into things like i'm not broken and most guys you know listen to the podcast will will have that this feeling is like i don't want to go and see a, a mental health expert because i've not i've got i haven't got any issues with my mental health but <laughs> the, the long and short of it was that i was struggling i was really struggling but the way that i manifested coping was to work harder. I threw myself into work 10 times more. And I was just, I literally get up in the morning, 6 a.m., work all day, and then go to bed like 10 o'clock and absolutely exhausted. And then one day I was, I was in the shower and I had this sort of pain in my temple. And I thought to myself, hang on a second, um, I, um, I'm struggling here. Like I'm, I'm in a, a lot of pain. And I got in touch with a friend of mine, even the men's retreat. And I really needed something to to help me at this point. And I, 
I, he said, oh, come on a men's retreat. And I went on this men's retreat and they started sharing, these guys just sitting around in a circle, sharing about their deepest struggles, challenges and fears and, and all this stuff. And I'd never been in that environment before with men really just opening up, uh, doing lots of yoga, taking our time, just slowing down. And, and I found, I was like, oh my gosh, this I've never done this before. And that really just threw me into this world of... Uh, of curiosity I was really curious about like okay hang a second I don't need a I don't I'm not broken so I don't need a mental health expert you know that's what my narrative is yeah I need to do a lot of personal work for me to be able to deal with the struggles of being 30 and coping with loss and coping with change and I realized this I just didn't have the coping mechanisms and this led me to a really really deep very very much like a explorative journey of discovering what it I needed to develop in myself to be a, a great man, and that's where men's work came in. And I, and I found that that a lot of men are put off by this term mental health because actually mental health is commonly associated with suicide, depression, and anxiety. And some men have levels of that; they experience levels of that, but they don't they don't see themselves as broken. And that's how I was sort of seeing myself. I'm like, I'm not broken. I'm really, you know, I feel okay. I just, I just hurt a lot. And I've, I'm doing these things that my, I can't really explain in my life, right? I work too hard. I don't have any boundaries. I get angry. And I had a lot of anger inside me. You know, speaking to tell you about this before, Ronnie, um, I would walk into my gym, which was a beautiful environment with people changing and, and doing really well. I'd have a smile. I'd be the guy wearing a smile but underneath I felt rage, like real rage. And I couldn't understand it. And until I, I realized I'd just been suppressing so much anger and hurt, I, I, you know, that's why I realized what was going on. And, and I think when I, but when I um, was about to come a, da a dad, I realized I was like, oh, hang on a second. I'm, I'm 34 now, 34. Yeah, I think I'm 34, 33, 34. Um, I need to do something about this. And I sought out a really, really good, well-trained psychotherapist and started to do some work with him. And it was so transformational. It didn't just help me in business. It helped my parenting. It helped my relationship. And I think that so many men miss out on that because they think that they have to go to seek that when they're broken, when they've when everything's gone too far. And my mission is to help men see that this is the best way for them to succeed long term so that's kind of like my backstory and how i've come to this point where i'm so um i'm so you know i'm so in love with doing the work and helping men do the same beautiful thank you thank you for sharing your story you're a coach and you do powerful men's work and you talked about counseling and also seeing a psychotherapist yourself so if someone say for example someone were a bit confused like they say okay i don't have many problems i don't have very deep issues or something like that uh, but i do feel that i'm suppressing you know emotions and everything so do you feel well equipped to handle those or are there like areas where you won't go to and say okay this is my domain this is what i can do as a coach and this is where you need to see a psychotherapist yeah, good question. Actually, this is something that's coming up a lot in our work um, on the Awaken Man. Is that you know, what? Where's our remit? Like, where do we actually? Um, and I love the I love the Steve Chandler definition. Is that um, therapy is about the past? I know you know it's not it's a very very generalized definition, but therapy is about the past. Mentoring is where you get you teach principles, and then coaching is about creating a future. Now, what we what I always say is that if there is something that is coming up that's stopping a person, a man, from moving forwards because it seems like this big anchor where they, they're making their past the future, they're saying, oh, well, I can't do this because this happened in the past, or there's some real um, clear, obvious blocks that are not easy to navigate through by creating a future, I'll recommend someone. I'll empower them to go and find some uh, psychotherapist to work alongside me. So absolutely, yeah, I always... Like a lot of my one-to-one -one, uh, coaching clients have a psychotherapist, and I've I've built uh, really really good alliances with people that some of them want to do somatic th um, psychotherapy, some of them want to do you know uh, more of a you know like um, CBT, all these different types of therapeutic interventions that work with different people. 
So yeah, I'm I'm a very very big uh, fan of being an expert at referring to experts instead of having to be the expert. My my role as a coach is to help someone create a future and step into it. Um, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. go in mining in the past with my clients. I think that's the role of someone who is trained to do that. Mm. Okay, and some people might not need to go there, but uh, and or do, might not want to go there. But for th- those people who think, oh, there's something in the past that's still bugging me that I'm carrying with me, I need to do some work. Then clearly, there's a role for that. A big part of it for me is is um, having to, like you know having the space to learn that, that actually there is something that's holding us back from our past. You know, like it wasn't until I spoke openly um, in a men's group where I shared about some of the things that I'd been through and got gone through as an adult. And um, one of the guys said, oh, yeah, I'll actually speak to a psychotherapist about that. And I was like, oh, never even thought of that. That would be, like, really helpful. And I, I do like the kind of analogy of, is like, a great therapist will help you put the handbrake on from the past. Like, I love the, the definition is that, like, coaching is putting your foot down on the accelerator and then therapy can be simultaneously removing the brake. Now, I love that definition because as a coach I'm, I'm forever helping people like how can we put the accelerator down and get your results faster and get you to create your future faster or you know easier and therapy for me personally has helped me put the brake down so when I do put my foot on the accelerator I just fly towards my goals and my challenges and there's not a lot of friction so I think that's a really good you know my own personal definition of, of the, the relationship between the two Ben, one of the things that we talked about last time was about anger. I, I thought about three ways people might try to deal with anger. Uh, I would like you to talk about all three. They would supp- try to suppress the anger because, oh, anger is a bad emotion. I should not be feeling anger kind of um, assumption. Secondly, they might project their anger because they don't know how else to cope with it. So they might end up projecting an ang- anger, so scaring other people. And, and the third one is about processing the anger. So can you tell us a bit about these three different types, uh, suppressing anger, projecting anger, and processing? Because you're a coach and you have done a lot of work with men. Tell us what you have seen so far in, in, as to what works, what doesn't work. Yeah, um, I, I think you know, just uh, from my own, my own experience is that um, in my own narrative, anger was bad because in my early childhood home, anger meant, uh, aggression which meant violence you know it wasn't necessarily like physical violence but it would be it would mean the destruction of relationships that was what my narrative around anger is like if someone is angry at someone else there's going to be a breakdown of a relationship so I didn't let anger come out so I would suppress I was a suppressor and then the way that that led to me feeling was that I'd suppressed anger for such a long time little things would make me fly into a rage inside and you could see it on my face, and I'd like, you know, tight jaw, and uh, and I think a lot of people do experience this, and it's like you think that you've got it all together, but it can be something that just kind of clicks and sets you off. And I think that's a lot of the constructs of of employment, and a lot of the way that, especially men, are, are not allowed to express healthy anger in different arenas now. I think that. This is, I think, a tinderbox. I think it's causing a lot of problems for men and women. And women, you know, just uh, my experience is talking to men about this. But um, so I, I learned that, that I, I needed to ex- learn to express my anger, my feelings, and what was happening for me and for a lot of other men I can I, I, I coach is that they experience something, they feel, and then they suppress, and then they talk about this maybe you know two weeks on. So something happens in their life and they don't have the ability to, to challenge someone for example so Rani and I are working together she does something that, that causes me to feel angry and I feel the anger but I don't say anything to, to Rani but what I do is I suppress my anger and then I just bitch off to maybe Rani's co-worker or I make passive aggressive comments at her so she should know that I'm angry <laughs> and so uh, what, what I, I feel is that um, I did this for far too long and that suppression led to me just really feeling a lot of emotional pain and rage and and that's what I say a lot of people do they just suppress it and they say I'm not angry um, you know I've got you know I don't I don't have anger anger's bad and they just see an anger as inherently a negative emotion when actually it's a really really powerful emotion for an entrepreneurial man 
an entrepreneurial woman. And, and I think that used in the right way, it propels us forwards. It helps us set healthy boundaries. It helps us have radically candid conversations and it allows us to push forwards in our lives. And, and I think that's what I was, you know, I became very, very um, lost and subdued in, in this process of bottling up all my anger. And so the other thing that happens is we, we, we then try and suppress it so much that it leaks out. It has to leak out. We can't keep it all together. It's almost like um, it, it, as soon as a crack opens up, it leaks out and projects onto someone. And I think that's what happens for a lot of people. They, they, they keep everything to themselves. They don't share, especially guys. They don't share. They don't speak about it. And then this one time where something happens in the world, like a divorce or a business breakdown or a, a change in their job or the, they just lose their temper or they just have this one moment where they just have a total meltdown. And, and I think that's what we see commonly with anger and that's why it has that negative association. Whereas what I've learned from my experience and working with guys that who I see learning to process anger is that actually it can be used very powerfully like even on Friday, we did a session with our men and they had to give each other radical candor, which was means care personally challenged directly. So we've got a group of guys, 25 guys on a call. They know each other fairly well and they were challenging each other saying, hey, Ronnie, you know, I, I can see you operating like this. And I can see it's not serving you. I'm saying this because I care and I want it, and I want it to change for you. So they were really like just pushing each other and challenging each other. And this comes from a place of anger, which is like, nope, I don't want this to continue. And honestly, the, the power that these men experienced in having that clean expression of anger or force was really, really powerful. So I think the word, the word that I you know, want to bring gravity that's see there is clean anger. It's powerful. It's not nonviolent. It's expressing to a fellow co- co-worker that they, you are angry, that there's nobody in danger. And I'd love to see a a society, more teams, organizations where people could express that and someone not feel that they were about to be hurt or they were about to have to endure psychological pain because someone else is angry. Because I think it's really really important to to bring this dialogue into into more um, relationships. Hopefully that makes sense. I've never heard of anger articulated that way. And let me just share with you something very personal. For a very, very uh, long time, I identified myself as an angry person okay I'm, I'm angry like even as a child i used to be very angry <laughs> so when my sisters used to tease me because we you know we are four four girls in the house so we were like fighting and we had our moments when we were nice and played together but we also fought and i was the angry one i didn't know how to process my anger and um so it's interesting because um I still get angry from time to time, but I see anger very differently now than how I saw back then. Back then, like uh, I used to be ashamed, like, oh my goodness, I'm in you know, this angry person. And over the years, as I have worked on myself and, and realized that, that anger is also just an emotion. We, the more work I have done on myself, I realize that I don't feel so much angry like anymore, you know, and, and I clearly don't identify myself as an uh, angry person at all. And that's been for years now. Uh, but I have spoken to men in the context of mental health as a psychiatrist. And I see a lot of people uh, identify themselves as an angry person because of stuff that happened in the past. And they have been through anger management and they're still angry. But it feels like there's also this thing about I can't forgive what someone did to me kind of thing going on as well. Like I can't forgive that. I think and most importantly, people sometimes can't forgive themselves. And so the anger is anger towards themselves. So have you noticed that in your work? Yeah, yeah. Well, well they, they, um, if you look at the Jungian kind of um, demonstration of like king, warrior, magician, lover, there's like a, when you, there's a really, really good men's work book called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. My, my job at the moment, I'm, I'm actually writing um, things to make it more up to date in terms of like so modern men can understand it and use it. Well, well. The, the warrior, the internal warrior in a, in a man uh, who creates structure uses anger and it's, it uses anger as a boundary setter saying, no, this is not okay. I'm not going to put, you know, put up with that anymore. I'm not going to tolerate this within myself. So actually anger can be quite a powerful um, emotion to shift 
your behavior. Like, I'm really not happy with the way that I'm showing up in this way at the moment. I'm angry. And that's powerful because it actually puts a stop to this. You know, and sometimes we have to get a level of um, force to create behavior change. And so uh, anger brings a lot of energy. Uh, and equally, this is something that I, I learned recently, um, is that I love the, the, the definition of anger is a tool, not a weapon. And I, I, this is like often used against ourselves as a weapon. Oh, you know, you, you self berate. So it's like a self berating weapon. You weaponize anger by making yourself feel bad and be angry at yourself. But it's a tool for, for good as well. So like for behavior change, but equally is that violence and aggression are something you do with anger. So anger itself isn't dangerous. It isn't negative. It isn't bad. But when we use it as a, as a weapon and we, we are aggressive or violent, that is when it's become problematic. So I think that was like really, I was like, wow, well, they, you know, I can really use my, my anger to get things done, to change my behaviors, to, to actually um, change the group I'm in. Like, I, you know, can I share with somebody when they're not pulling their weight, I'm angry about this and I don't want this con to continue. And I think that part of my relationship with Poppy um, is for her to, to be able to hold me in my anger. Like I, I can express when I'm angry about something and her not to feel like there's any danger at all. And that in my home has been tremendously beneficial. Being able to say to her, I'm really angry about this. I'm, I'm really angry about you know, something about the house or there'd be something being messy or something... Um, my you know me me letting myself down or something i can express it and the the difference between that and my 20s where i used to suppress it i feel so much better there's a i'm happier i'm i'm, I'm much better um, connected and this is something that i was talking to a, a group about the other day is that when you express anger towards another person in a powerful really really pragmatic way that shows that you care Actually, I think it improves relationships. You know, powerful challenge. Like, you know, I don't know if you might want to speak about this, Ronnie, but when someone's been really, really candid with you and said, listen, I'm really not happy with this. I think you should change or I should change or we should change this situation. And they're quite direct and forceful and you can feel the anger, but you feel super safe. You have a lot of respect for that person, especially when they're not coming at you as, a, as an aggressive, angry, violent person. You're like, oh, he's really... He's really pissed off about this, but <laughs> um, I feel like, yeah, I, I better shift. It's like, you know, when someone holds you to be uh, to account and I think that's a super, super um, valuable part of, of any relationship. I have a question for you then, Ben. What I'm hearing in this conversation is the importance of a safe space for person to express themselves. Most of the time, I guess that the safe space might not be there for some. And I'm, I'm thinking of maybe is there a distinction between anger and rage? I just wonder if uh, someone, say, wants to, they have been suppressing for a long, long time and they want to express themselves, but their partner doesn't get it. So surely there is some kind of work to be done with the couple, like you, you and Poppy. I'm sure you have done some work around this and where you're not just saying to Poppy and saying, OK, all right, I won't be angry. Surely there has <laughs> been some conversations when you have... Um, you, you both have sat down and said what it means to be held for you, how important it is for you to express that. Um, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, 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 it's a really good point. And I think that there's so, like, I'm very lucky that I've done a lot of work around expressing it in a, in a safe space, like with uh, a really uh, qualified uh, therapist that, you know, if I started there and but then it's it's also um, where you've got this real um, great opportunity to to be more expressive about it. So then it doesn't turn into rage. Like if you think about this, is that rage is where, like for me, this is my own definition, is where I've suppressed something, suppressed something, suppressed something, and then it clicks, and it's like it's like uh, I've I've built. I've built the fire, I've built the fire, I've built the fire but with, uh, you know, suppressing the anger, not sharing it, not not doing the processing work. And then there's something that ignites the fire and I can't hold it in and, I, and it shows up as rage. So I think that I like this term prehab and rehab, you know, 
<laughs> I love the word prehab. It's like do the work before it becomes an issue. And this is what, you know, even with a lot of guys who come on our program or I speak to on a daily basis is that they'll say, I don't need to do any, any anger work. I'm, I'm not angry. Or I was like, great, well, keep it that way. You know, do the expressive work. Do the, have a, a healthy anger practice. Um, have something there you can go and express yourself on a, on a frequent basis and you'll stay like that. I like look at a lot of martial artists. They express clean anger when they are doing their their their, their martial art. And I think that's what's happening is that when you've got these arenas where you can really express yourself and be uh, and let this out, this is when it, it becomes less problematic. But I think there's more of a problem for guys that say, I haven't got an issue. I've got no practice to share my th- thoughts or feelings. And but then it just it just builds up like 1% after 1% over years. And it, sometimes it can take half a year where you like, like my, my life went a little bit topsy turvy over six months. So it was a quite a lot of things I had to be angry about over six months. Whereas some guys, I think that it happens over like 20, 30 years. They just, you know, became these angry old men. <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. And the final point, and there's something from Brené Brown actually, that she said that anger actually includes a lot of the more subtle and soft and tender emotions that men don't like to express, like shame, like humiliation, like sadness and grief. And one of the things that's been really helpful for me when I've done psychological work, where I've, where I've done expression of anger and done things that have helped me get in a state that is really angry and being safe, is that the stuff that's come up afterwards so um, just on one of our recent retreats is that we had a room full of men, you know, 15 men who did a psychotherapeutic intervention where they smashed a bat onto a punch bag. It was really quite cathartic. It was like, ah, you know, let it all out. And then afterwards, there was a group of men who were, were sobbing, like literally letting the tears flow and letting it all out. And men in that room would, were crying and having not expressed that emotion never cried for 10, 15 years. Because what had happened is, is that anger recludes a lot of those more tender emotions which they don't want to let out. And then they release the valve and then all of the other more soft and gentle and the things that men shouldn't show come up. And that, and that for me, is the where the gold is, is being able to really feel those emotions. Like I, I had grief coming up, I had sadness, I had you know thoughts and feelings about my dad coming up. And... That was all because I paved way by letting go of of the anger that was holding it back. Hopefully that makes sense because I mm. think you know that's quite a it's not a yeah. very well well experienced um, phenomenon for men. I love it. I love what you're saying because there's there's something about the conditioning from the society. Men don't cry or you don't show your emotions, and then you you're going around with all these emotions around you, building up, building up, building up. What I'm hearing here is the importance of. Um, men being able to do this kind of work we don't need to wait until okay we have a real problem why can't we start today even when we are okay we are not having much problem and that's the work of a coach anyway because you are helping them design or create a future of their choice i love the title of your programs awaken men program what is awaken men and what is different from normal ordinary men tell, tell us the <laughs> distinction here yeah ben. what what makes a man awakened gosh i uh... So this is really funny, actually, running up. When I, um, I went, that's why I work in co-working with my mentor, a guy called Yasin, and my, my business partner, Pete. And I remember when he first invited me to come and be the lead coach on it, and I was like, Yasin, I can't be this. I can't do this. I'm, I'm not an awakened man. I'm so far from being an awakened man. You know, like, and he goes, this is exactly why you need to do it, man. I was like, so, <laughs> yeah. So it was like, you know, it was quite serendipitous. It, it was the work that I was doing on myself. And, and he, he said, um, and it was true. It was really true. And an awakened man is is a, is a man who is actualizing his potential. Now, um, the Maslow, you know, Abraham Maslow, famed for the, the hierarchy of needs. People talk about that all the time. Less famed for his saying, "What what one can be, one must be." And what he meant by that was, it's as important for a human to self actualize as it is for the the simple needs, like the um, the safety needs. Now, I didn't realize that. It's like, I didn't really get it at first. So how can self-actualizing be as important as the safety needs? Well, actually, in the modern Western world, our safety needs 
albeit even if you're at the bottom of the um, socioeconomic ladder, they still you can still function, you can still get food, you can still get water, you can still get shelter. Um, most people, you know, who who I coach and work with, they don't have major concerns about the, their safety needs. The biggest threat to them is psychopathology. It's anxiety, depression, you know, suicide ideation. That's the biggest risk to a modern man, you know, and, and woman as well, is that the biggest risk that you have to your to your life is probably psychopathology. Yeah, would you agree, Ronnie? That, you know, anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, um, excessive stress to the point where it causes you cancer, all these sorts of things, you know, they, all these things are the biggest threat to the human. So the only way for somebody to to almost guarantee themselves long-term psychological wellness, this is what from what Maslow said, is to become what they're capable of being. Because in the pursuit of becoming what we're capable of being is where we find joy. And that for me, like um, I, I follow a lot of what a guy called si- um, Sean Acor's work. And Sean Acor studies happiness. And I, and I came across his definition of happiness um, quite a few years ago, and it made a lot of sense to me. So happiness is the joy that we experience striving towards our potential. So if we're constantly trying to pursue this impossible image of what we could become, we're always going to be taking that plus one step forwards. So this is, this is like, you know, on a scale. So imagine that, um, you today, Ronnie, you're at zero. And Rani, um, she's got <laughs> some work that she needs to do. And it's really difficult. It's impossible. <laughs> she's been putting it off. And it gets around to 11 o'clock and she says, oh, do you know what? I'm not going to do it today, Ben. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to, I'm going to choose some comfort. I'm just going to go and sit on the sofa and watch some Netflix. That's fine. But she then tomorrow has to do that work still. So, Rani doesn't start at zero. She starts at minus one on the the the, the uh, on the scale of like actualization. So she's minus one. She's one step closer to psychopathology. So Tuesday rocks round and she says, "Oh, I need to do that work," but she's feeling that like just a little bit contracted. And she says, "Oh, do you know what? I'll put it off till Wednesday because Wednesday's a good day for me to do it." I know. And then so Wednesday rocks round. She's uh, she's actually at minus two, and then by the end of the week. She's been putting off this work, choosing comfort all the way through the week, not doing the work. And she gets to Friday and she's like, why do I feel like the need for a bottle of wine? And because what it is, is she's trying to numb the feeling that all week she's chosen these micro comfort decisions all the way through the week. And she's not at minus two anymore. She's at minus minus five. And she feels that psychological pain, that struggle. Does that make sense, Ronnie? Yeah. You with me? She's, she's, she's like mm-hmm. minus five. She either chooses wine, alcohol, sweets, crisps, um, avoidance. It could be any sort of coping mechanism that we all have. And that's why she's struggling. So she's cho- chosen grow, sorry, comfort decision after co- comfort decision. And she's not comfortable. She's actually very uncomfortable. She's anxious. She's struggling. She's, she's feeling uh, burdened with this like work that she hasn't done. Ronnie, on the other hand today, She's at zero. She makes that decision. Like, I'm going to go and really focus on this work at 11 o'clock. And she chooses the growth decision. She knows it's uncomfortable. But tomorrow, when she goes to make do her next piece of work, she's at plus one. And so with every plus one decision that Rani makes all the way through the week, she moves forwards towards growth and discomfort. So she's choosing that uncomfortable thing every single day. And going back to what the awakened man is, is the awakened man is choosing that uncomfortable decision moment to moment and having a support network of men who are doing the same. And I I love that because when you get to Friday and you've made five steps forwards and you think, hang on a second, this week has been really difficult, but God, I've grown. I feel so much, I feel so much better. Like I've looked at some of my hardest weeks I've ever had. I get to Friday and I'm like, I don't need alcohol. I don't need to kind of just eat my body weight in ice cream i feel really good i'm really happy with how i feel it hasn't been easy but i've grown and i've moved forward and i think that's the difference between the two and when you have the support structures Mm. to make those uncomfortable decisions day in day out i think your life changes exponentially you know really does and and i've seen it I've, i've experienced it myself and going back to why i said to you seen well you know i'm not that guy that's 
the Awaken Man, I realised that for about three, four years, I was probably choosing quite a few uh, comfort- comfortable decisions. And uh, But then I've, I've changed. And uh, that's why I've seen a massive shift in myself. I love it. It's interesting, isn't it? When we choose comfort and we end up becoming uh, not comfortable. <laughs> and then divide that. Oh, what's the point? I've already put on some weight. I can't be bothered anyway. Forget it. Netflix is so much easier. And then we, we give up on our dreams and we just stick to... Uh, and we keep reporting on our life like oh it's boring and it's like uh, stressful but what can you do about it we get into that mindset what can you do about it well actually we know what we have not been doing but i'm also hearing something here that steve chandler uses uh, the difference between intention versus commitment so uh, without any coach without any uh, accountability we might have good intentions we might think okay i'm going to do this we then go more to us uh the comfort food, the comfortness rather than the uncomfortable versus having a group like yours would be like having that kind of commitment. So you promise, but you also have that accountability where you have the structure, support structure in place. Your mind might say, well, I don't want to do it today, but then ultimately you know that you, you have made a commitment and you show up with your commitment. Yeah. Beautiful. I, I love that as well. Yeah. Like um, I was listening to the other day when he was talking about the, the difference between being a victim and an owner in your life. And what distinguishes the difference between a victim and an owner? And a victim sees a commitment as a feeling, whereas an owner sees a commitment as a commitment. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was so me. Like, you know, I, I think I've got a PhD in victim uh, thinking and, and language. <laughs> I was like, yeah, uh, my, my whole twenties was like, uh, why did I spend an extraordinary, like extraordinary amount of money on self development? Yet I still didn't feel like I'd moved forwards. It's like. Oh, at a cellular level, I was behaving like a victim. And I was really like, it was, I was quite grateful to be called out on that. And I, I could see that. It's like, oh yeah, you hear people saying, I don't feel committed today. I don't feel like doing that work today. You know, going back to that, that analogy I gave before, it's like that really difficult work Granny's got to do. It's like, oh, I don't feel like doing that. But if she's an owner, she says, I'm committed. I don't, my feelings don't really matter in this situation. I can still do the work. And um, I realized that's how I behaved. You know, I put something in my calendar. I would see that it was going to ch- challenge me. And I was like, oh, I don't feel like doing that. I'll, I'll avoid that. Well, me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and uh, it made me laugh because like, I, I, did a, I did a session the other day for the group on being a victim versus an owner in my life. And I just shared my own my experience. But um, ultimately if we want to make those plus one decisions where we're going to grow, it is uncomfortable and we do need to be an owner. And uh, I've seen massive shifts when guys really start to own their their own lives and and make those positive steps. And because some of these things are difficult, like owning your life and taking full responsibility is difficult. Um, Having a group of men are doing the same. So you don't feel like a lone wolf is powerful and like you know i say group of men group of women i think that women do this way better than guys like women are way way more effective uh, at getting together than men and then men pride themselves on being lone wolves you know if anyone knows anything about nature you don't get a lone wolf in in nature wolves wolves are pack animals Mm. and so it's the same Mm. in 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 men you know men need other men and it's so important for Mm. long-term like performance for guys to have other men around them i know you have an event coming up in january tell us about it yeah um my impossible goal right so uh so when when i, I do any work with men uh one of the first things we do is we set an impossible goal an impossible goal being something that just they cannot fathom how they're going to do it it's going to stretch them because then this paves the way for those plus one decisions i have to make plus one decisions every day to in order to achieve my goal and and it creates that psychological wellness as well, I believe, anyway. And um, I just like said to you, seen and Pete, it's like, we haven't got an impossible goal. It's like, this, we're, so we need an impossible goal. So I said, I'm going to get the best speaker in the world of men's work. I'm going to bring 200 men together. I'm going to talk about men's psychology. I'm going to call it men's business. It's about the the, the work that men need to do to be a great father, husband, leader, you know, entrepreneur, lead, you know, leader in their business or leader in their job, in their career. And we're just going to have a really good pragmatic discussion about it for a day. And so we've we've uh, we've got an event on the 28th of January 2023. And we're actually getting guys to, to get in a room 
and talk about this work that we've had the discussion on today's podcast. And I think it's really important because when guys really understand the, well, I'd say the, the canvas of all of these emotions and how they can use them and how they can do this work, I think that their life changes huge amounts. And I, I'm not saying that just from my own experience. I, I've watched uh, 25, 35 guys this last two years. I've seen their results in their businesses, their parenting, their relationships, their self-worth, their confidence just skyrocket because they've been around other men doing this work. And I just, I'm a real, like, I'm just like a, I'm quite, I'm quite evangelical about it. I, I want to share this as much as possible. So, yeah, thank you for, you know, even asking about the event, Ronnie. It means a lot. Well, I, I would love to have a link to your um, to your event so that we can put it on the show notes. And, um, yeah, no, that will be amazing. Um, I know that what you're providing is something that's really needed because people uh, on, in, on social media hear that people say, oh, we need to talk about men's health. We need to talk about men's health. But it's like saying we need something, but not people are not sure what exactly they need. And from our conversation today, it feels like it's not just one angle you come from. You're, you know, you're talking about having, I, I love your expression of understanding the canvas of emotions. And then you also talked about the self-actualized men. So, you know, you're, you're going to cover all of those. Ben, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of this conversation. But is there any final thoughts you would like to leave for the listeners listening to this uh, podcast? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, it's like that old adage was like the absence of disease is not it's not wellness. And it's the same with psychological performance. Just because you're not struggling, it doesn't mean you're not performing. And I think that's what um, a lot of this work can do for you as a man. Just because you're not struggling, it doesn't mean that you are creating that abundance of of um, of results that could you could you know. And I think that's what a lot of men struggle with. Is like, oh well, I'm not I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious. I'm not uh, you know I'm not I haven't got any uh, uh, suicidal thoughts. But my question to you is like, are you flourishing? Do you feel that you're absolutely working at your peak every single day? And if, that, if the answer to that is yes, well, fantastic. Psychological work can help you do that. And that's what I'm a big um, advocate for. It's like, I want to perform at my very best every single day. Excellent. Right. So anyone wants to uh, get in touch with uh, you, Ben, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, Facebook, Benjamin Owen on Facebook. And we've got so we, like we've got the Awaken Man Project. Um, we've actually got a really, really good group on Facebook called the Awaken Man Project. And if you join that, we put like regular like weekly trainings on there about men's psychology, about masculinity, about business, about sales, all sorts of things that would help a modern man achieve in uh, the modern landscape so yeah join that group or if you're not on facebook uh, you've got www.awakenedman.org uh, that's our website where we've got all our events and free trainings and stuff like that on there as well ben i think this is the first time i have talked uh, about men's uh, men's challenges and men's uh, health in the podcast and i i thank you because i think this is this is a very rich um, conversation we had and you know not just men need to hear about it but even you know women and need to, need to hear about how they can support men and i hope they find this conversation extremely enriching and i definitely learned a lot of things from you oh thank you ronnie absolute pleasure